So this is profoundly better than three or four years ago when I talked about education. I had to follow Cam Wright's talk about his son and his experiences in the military when he got a standing ovation and there was tears in everybody's eyes and then you guys introduced me to talk about e-learning right after that. So I'm a lot more excited about, I think I got a better crowd here. So I was asked to talk about electronic educational opportunities and so I'll try and sort of review what we can do with this and what we are doing right now with this. So I'll just start with this lecture. I think Dawn could have used this as well so that this is a great slide, but at every crossroad on the road that leads to the future, each progressive spirit is opposed by a thousand men, or in this case, probably about 60 or 70 men and women appointed to guard the past. And so as, as you go through this talk and, and as I walk my way through this talk, just think about that, that, that we are trying to push this forward. We're not trying to hurt anybody by doing this. So let's look at how we educate in general. So the classic way that we educate is through a curriculum. Uh, any educational system, whether it be a kindergarten class or a high level graduate medical education program is going to have to have a curriculum as a design. It's the blueprint. And they all include the same pieces. They start with assessing the needs of the learner, what you want. That defines the goals and objectives of the learning exercise. Once you know what the goals and objectives are, then you can move forward by deciding what instructional methods you want to employ. And then you'll pick some content to add to that, you know, reading material, lectures, things like that. You'll do the actual teaching and the learning that goes on with it. And then you'll assess progress. Uh, and then you go into a little closed route with an escape, right? You'll, you'll assess whether they're educated. If they're not, you'll go back and you'll do more teaching and learning. And you'll keep doing that loop until you finally have an educated student and you finish the process. Well, we do the exact same thing in graduate medical education with our trainees. We, we use lectures. We use role modeling. We use clinical work, uh, sometimes we bring in simulation, sometimes we add readings in, but all these are the tools, the instructional methods that we employ to train our residents. When it comes down to identifying or, or creating content, well, we obviously use textbooks, which are uniformly available. We use articles from Medline. We have library access, Medline, we have Google access, um, and then of course there are patients and the cases that we allow our residents to participate in. All these are used as instructional content or material that we use to educate our trainees. And then when it comes time to assess our learners, we have the in-training exam, we have the American Board of Thoracic Surgery's final exam, we have global assessments that we use throughout their training, we have direct observations, sometimes we have simulation exercises and we assess them there, and all these sorts of tools are available to us to assess. But there are a lot of threats to our system right now. I'm not going to go into high detail, but we see those threats all the time and we see those threats right now. When do we add links as a goal and objective for our residents? When do we add POEM? When should we add elements like we're hearing about right now? When do we make that decision that that should become part of our trainees' educational goals and objectives? These sorts of questions are going to come at us faster and faster as newer and newer technologies are brought to bear. What is our responsibility in terms of training these residents with all these new technology that keep coming in and keep changing the playing field on us over and over again, pretty much on almost a monthly basis at this point, especially in oncology. When we look at the uh, determining the instructional methods, here there's a lot of variability. Not everybody is built to give a lecture. Not everybody can teach in the operating room. We have a lot of variability when it comes to our skill as instructors, and we receive no education in terms of how to be a better instructor. Most of us, essentially the analogy is the graduates of high school are now teaching high school. There is no training involved in making us better teachers. When we look at the creation of the identification of content or learning material, that's an enormous problem. There is a flood of content that is coming into availability almost on an hourly basis. The amount of knowledge that's accessible to our trainees and that is expanding exponentially is unbelievable. And somehow the resident has to grasp all that material, be able to quickly identify what pieces of material within that gamut of material that's being thrown at them is the most important and that they should focus on and what they can ignore. 
And then probably our biggest area of problem is in how we assess our trainees. Doing a single exam once a year that provides feedback in all sorts of areas is akin to having somebody take seventh grade math and not having them do any homework the entire year, not having them do any tests during the entire year, giving them a single final exam at the end of the year and allowing them to base their entire education on that one exam. Yeah, we do global assessments and yes, we do direct observation, but for the most part, a lot of those assessments tend to be very limited in scope and really don't provide a lot of detailed feedback to allow the trainee to do a formative assessment of their skills so that they can look at where their gaps are and they can start to improve. So how can electronics help us educate better? And really, I think this is the wrong question. I don't think we want to help them educate better. We want to help our trainees learn better. And am I just wordsmithing there between educate and learn? I don't think so. And, and there is a big difference between how we educate and learn. When we look at our paradigm, we have a teacher. Here I've made a bright lit yellow box. And then we have a bunch of students down here. And the classic model, everything we learned when we were in K-12 education, is that the teacher possesses the knowledge, and the knowledge is distributed down to the students. And it flows in a uniform direction from teacher down to students. And that's really the process education and when you look at the definition of education it's to give someone training in or information on a particular field if you notice in there there's no inclusion in that definition of what happens on the receiving end education is a verb to educate it's the process of providing information to somebody I would say that education defines this part of the teaching process the flow from the teacher down to the student or from student to student but it's the process that's being defined when we talk about education what we want to focus on really is on learning learning if you look at the definition is to gain or acquire knowledge or skill in something by study experience or being taught and if you notice there the act of teaching is just one of the many ways that people can learn study and experience are very dominant ways and as people grow older and we move from K through 12 up into the adult learner study and experience make a much greater component of learning than actually teaching does because by the time we get a hold of our trainees or by the time a CME course gets a hold of a faculty member they have an enormous wealth of experience that they bring to the table with them and you're going to have to mold that experience into their new learning. You can't simply erase what they've done for the last 10, 20, 40 years and insert new knowledge. You're going to have to let them learn the new knowledge. And so learning focuses more on the individual trainee. And that's where I think electronics can really help us. When we look at what we really want out of an education, what's interesting is when we think about what we really want out of an education, it's exactly what electronics can provide us. You look at those two images, that's the classic way that we have educated. Send them to the library to read, bring them to the patient's bedside to, to you know, Socratically quiz them. And that's been the method of teaching that we've used, and it does work well. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that system, and I don't want anybody in this room to think that I am berating or limiting the effectiveness of that technique. But really, electronics can help us do exactly what we want out of a good education, and that is it can allow customization of that education. It can allow motivation to take place for learning. And then it can provide equalization. Um, I don't have the links available at my institution. We don't do POEM at MD Anderson, all right? So the ability to equalize my trainee's education to a trainee's education at the Mayo is something that electronics can let us do. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to pay to send my resident to the Mayo so he or she can learn from the faculty of the Mayo on links and on POEM and on these techniques that aren't available at my institution. Electronic learning is a way to provide and equalize that training across institutions. So it really can improve self-directed learning, which is the key to adult education. It's not a novel concept. These are just three of the books that I've read that are out there that I would strongly encourage you. The first one, Disrupting Class, is an awesome book. I don't know if anybody recognizes the author there, Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christensen wrote another great book called The Innovator's Dilemma. In it, he discusses the idea of disruptive technology that comes in and turns upside down an industry which is doing everything right, 
to produce a good product for their clients. And in this book, Disrupting Class, he says that electronics is going to be the disrupting technology that is going to completely change the way we perform K-12 education. And Getting Smart was written by Tom Vander Ark. Tom Vander Ark runs a consulting firm. He gave up his billion dollar company to go into this consulting and he has consulted states at the federal level and at the local level on how to integrate disruptive technology like this into the classroom. And he makes a number of estimates in that book. It, it was published in 2011, but it was probably written in 2009 and 10. And what's amazing is his estimates were wrong. He underestimated. In the book, he estimated about a 20% increase in the use of online education per year in classrooms across the United States. Currently, it's at 46% increase in electronic education per year across the United States. Over 15 million children are now being self-schooled, which represents probably about 15 to 20% of the children are now being self-schooled through electronic education. And then the last book there just came out a couple of years ago. It's by Salman Khan, and some of you may know Salman Khan, and I'll go in a little bit more about him in the next slide, but Sal Khan wrote The One World Schoolhouse, and this is where he's building up the idea of equalization through electronic education. Well, what is Sal Khan? I'll just tell you, he's one of the two examples that I'll give you of how the application of this stuff works. What Sal Khan was, he was a hedge fund manager, if anybody knows. And if anybody wants a good experience, just go to that TEDx San Jose talk. Uh, if you go to the TED website, you can find Sal Khan's TED talk there. But he was tutoring his niece in New Orleans. He was in Boston, hedge fund manager. She's in New Orleans. Uh, she's having trouble in math. She's been smart all the time. He starts tutoring her over the phone. It's getting harder and harder from the tutor. Some of his other cousins, he has an extended Indian family. Some of the other cousins want in on this tutoring. So he starts creating videos and he posts them on YouTube. And suddenly he has a following worldwide. Eventually he quits his job to produce YouTubes. He's got over 3,600 videos now instructing in all elements of math, science, geography, geology, history, chemistry, all these areas. He puts them into a website. He receives $4 million from Google and another $2 million from uh, the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And now is full time with Khan Academy. And Khan Academy has now moved into the school system. And it's allowing students to utilize the website, utilize the videos to teach themselves. And the teacher comes in as a tutor. So the classroom, instead of being directed the way it is right now where I'm lecturing you. Instead, the students come and work continuously on their own and the teacher simply moves through the classroom and provides tutoring. The model is now being accepted at more and more schools and the SAT testing system has just engaged Sal Khan right now to help provide instruction to boost SAT scores as well. But you look at that and you say, yeah, well, that's all fuzzy and he's writing books, it's not really science. Well, there actually is science, all right? And this one, was published in science, all right? And I don't know how many educational papers get into science, but this has got to be one of the few. This was a wonderful example of the idea of what's called flipping the classroom. And that is where instead of the teacher being the lecturer and the person with the knowledge distributing it to the students, the students go out and gain a lot of knowledge on their own and come to the classroom and the teacher now acts as a tutor and a coach. And, and builds up the students who are having trouble with the problems or takes students who have already got that element and pairs them up with students that are having difficulty so the students can help each other learn. And what they did in this study that was published in Science is they took a college level physics course with about 200 kids in the course and they took out a component of that course teaching a segment that usually takes a professor about one week to get through that segment. They pre-tested the students, and then they had them take the class with the highest rated professor, the one who gets the top scores every year that everybody loves, that everybody says is the best teacher. They had them teach the section, and then they quizzed the students at the end of the course. Then the next year, they took another group of 236 students, and they gave him a TA who had never taught physics before. And the TA was taught how to teach using the flipping the classroom techniques, they provided lectures online for the students that they had to do prior to arrival at the class. And then during the class, all the TA did was move around through the class and coach the students who were having difficulty with those concepts or paired up students who were doing well with the ones that were having difficulty. 
When they took the test, you can see it there on the graph. There was no comparison. The students who were taught by the non-experienced TA in physics who used the flipping the classroom outperformed the students who were taught by the highly ranked and highly rated teacher. So even electronics can help even an effective teacher become a better teacher. And, and this is just two examples. I, I could spend all 20 minutes showing you the examples of how this is working in the nation. And, and both of these authors are, are saying exactly what I said just a few minutes ago. Clayton Christian said teachers are going to act more as learning coaches and tutors to help students find the learning approach that makes the most sense for them. And Sal Khan said it was never my vision that watching computer videos and working out problems should comprise a kid's entire education. My hope was to make education more efficient. And that's what we want to do by bringing electronics in to our educational system. So what are we doing right now in thoracic surgery? Um, let's start with the learner. This is our trainees right in the middle, and that's where we're going to keep the trainee from here on out. The first thing we decided to hit was what we would say the low-hanging fruit, all right? We want to get some content online and available to the trainees ubiquitously across the country so they have access to the same core content that we're not switching from textbook to textbook from location to location. Well, we're not the first ones to do this, all right? There, there are a lot of people that are doing this. This is just a few of the institutions or, or societies that are doing it. EANS is the European Association of Neurosurgery. They have entire core curriculum that's online. Uh, ACS Surgery is, of course, a textbook that is a wiki type. It's a textbook that is updated on a regular basis. It's electronic. Everybody here who works with a general surgery program knows of SCORE. SCORE is their online curriculum. STAT OG is through the Royal College of uh, OBGYN in uh, the United Kingdom. And then Pedia Link is through the American Association of Pediatrics. They also have that. This is just five examples. There are countless examples. But there are a number of lessons that we've learned from watching how these people have done it. And one of the key is that it's very, very easy to add content. Anybody can put a new song into their iTunes. Content management is nothing more than an iTunes library. You can keep adding song after song after song. The key is that if you do that, you will overwhelm your trainees and essentially you'll get nothing more than a larger and larger library. Um, increasing content does not equal better education because Google's been around for a long time and our board rates are still slipping. The fact that they have access to large amounts of content isn't the key. The key is still to teach. We still have to be an instructor as we build this. And we need editorial oversight. And the best way that I can describe the benefit of editorial oversight is I'd ask you to look at this table right here. And I don't know, there's seven times, there's 35 words up there. And I ask you to memorize those words. When you look at that, it's a jumble of words. It's very complex. If I then organize it for you and I say, well, now look at it this way. Is this easier to learn when it's organized like this, or is it easier to learn when it was organized like this? Clearly, the benefit of having a teacher to organize the knowledge for you is where we need to be working as teachers. It's not enough for us to just put information online. And so when we built this site that is now available, we put a lot of effort into building an editorial structure. We copied the journals. We put in position topic editors, and we identified topic editors. Some of them are in this room right now. Those people are responsible for their section, for perusing the literature, and identifying the best, most up-to-date content to hit that topic. And that's what's been placed out there. For our, our content management system, we went to a system called the brain, because one of the other problems is when those lists of content start getting long, it becomes very difficult to search. And the way the brain works, and you've seen it at some of the other meetings, is it uses a mind mapping technology. So whenever you click on one of these uh, items, uh, it'll open up another window that are linked to that. And you'll keep working your way through the brain until you get to the final sort of leaves on the end of the tree, which is where all the content is. Hey is hanging. And the ability to, to sort of surf this system and just move around from content to content is very easy and very user friendly. And so that's the system that we placed in first. And we allow the trainees to interact directly with that content back and forth. 
The second thing that we wanted to add almost immediately was the ability to self-assess. Because as I said, one of our biggest problems is we give our residents one test each year, one test at the end of the training, and then some very blunt sort of cudgel-like instruments where we rate them throughout the year that really don't give them that defined feedback that they need. So we wanted to put in place the ability to self-assess. And this is what we built right here. Uh, you can click on it, Frank, to get the video started. But this is, this is the website right here, what we used, and I'll explain that in a second. The site that we used is an online management of learners because what we really want to be able to do is report this data back directly to the learner and also to their teachers. And so what we, we used was a system called Moodle. And Moodle sounds funny, it stands for Modular Object Oriented Dynamic Learning or something like that. It was built out of MIT amazingly, it's an open source software. It was launched in about 2004, so it's barely a decade old. And currently across the globe there are 70 million users on Moodle that are using it. There are over, let me think, 11,000 separate Moodle sites in the United States alone. And these are not small sites. These are major universities are using this. University of Minnesota uses Moodle quite extensively throughout their medical school education. Toyota uses Moodle. NPR uses Moodle. Um, some of the other major societies throughout the country have grasped Moodle and some universities has. As you can see there in the background that was flowing, what we did was went to CSATs, got all their old questions. They graciously allowed us to have them. We called through those, sent them out to the editors. The editors reviewed them to make sure that they were up to date, and then we loaded them into each of the topics that we have in our Moodle curriculum. And the residents can take these questions as many times as they want. Every time they go to a topic, they're given a randomly selected question from a bank of questions that's relevant to that topic. The answers are switched around each time, so even if they get the same question, the answers may be in a different order, so it'll be different for them each time. And the other things that we've done is, is, again, we're not the first here. SCORE has nearly 2,000 questions embedded in their system, but what we did is we decided that we would organize them relevant to the topics, and we were going to get data back, meaningful data, back to the trainees and back to their instructors so that they could build on that information. And as I said, the architect of this, or the, the platform that we decided to use was Moodle, primarily because it's free. And so far, to embed all these questions and do everything we've done, we've probably paid, including time for the people at the uh, Joint Council headquarters who are on salary, we've probably paid less than a quarter of a million dollars to put all this out there. Uh, in the same time period, SCORE has spent over $8 million. And we actually are poised to pull ahead of SCORE very quickly with what we can offer that they still don't offer yet. So we have the self-assessment piece in. The next thing we decided to do was add teaching tools. And this is, when I talk about teaching tools, you say, well, isn't assessment tools teaching tools? Well, these are different. We're, we're putting in some offline activities, things that the trainees can do with their faculty one-on-one -on -one at their small group discussion sessions, at their lecture sections, things that they can de get done on their own offline and spend some time talking about. These are static tools or questions. SCORE does this too. They have recommended questions, if you've ever looked at it, for discussion, to lead a discussion. We went to the TSRA and we asked them if we could have access to their clinical scenarios book. We then poured through that book. We went again to our section editors and we asked them to look through these. And then we loaded the ones that were relevant for each topic. So you can click on this, you can print it, you can read through it. It's all available to the trainees. And you can use it as a point of discussion at your weekly discussion sessions with the trainees. But there are some other interactive activities that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface on yet. Moodle has the capacity to do what are called learning plans. Uh, learning plans are similar to what you see there in Fundamentals of Surgery. Essentially, it's a simulation. You'll be presented with, an with some sort of scenario. There'll be questions to ask. Depending on which response you give, you'll be taken to another page where there'll be more information. So you can walk your way through a scenario, much like a simulation on clinical decision making. The problem with, of course, is it's it's, it's intense on the front end to build these things. It takes a lot of work to build these things. This will come. The potential to do this is there. We just haven't spent the time yet. So we launched our site in uh, August of 2013. Um, we extended invitations to all the trainees in North America as well as the program directors and program coordinators. So the initial launch went to about uh, 
550 or so, 500 people. And you can see there the curve on the uh, left side of the screen, that is new users to the site. You can see there was an initial rise pretty quickly right there with the initial launch. Um, we had to get some copyright issues down with the publishers of the few textbooks that we included in the curriculum. That took us a few more weeks to allow us to increase and expand the size of enrollment. And on September 15th, we are now able to extend enrollment to all teaching faculty in North America. So everybody who is engaged in teaching a resident now has access. And you can see that bump right there that took place with those two arrows where some additional people came onto the site. We've been... Uh, we added those questions in January of 2016 after they went through all the editorial process. And you can see again that bump, those two dips in the weekly utilization, that's the curve on the right, those two dips correspond to Thanksgiving and to Christmas. So to, uh, everybody sort of went off and had their holidays and stopped using it. But as soon as Christmas was over, it bumped back up again. And then you can see there's been another rise that sort of came up with the introduction of the questions. Right now, I would say that we have about 175 to 200 unique users accessing the site each week. And considering there's only about 300 and so trainees currently registered, that means that we're cycling through all the trainees probably once every couple of weeks, all right? Every trainee is getting access to that. In fact, we have the capacity to look at exactly how frequently, so I'm sort of like the, uh, the Snowden of thoracic surgery right now, and I can see everything. And uh, I can see the frequency of use, and we have some people who are accessing this site as frequently as every day or every other day. The mode use of frequency is about every eight days. Uh, that's the most frequent use, but I would say the average is closer to about every three weeks. There's a big clump of people who are using it about once a week, which corresponds with its, its sort of parallel with the weekly sessions that trainee programs are doing. So that's what we have currently, but we have a lot of plans, uh, and there are a number of advances that we're looking at already. One of them is to include summative exams. So Moodle has the capacity to do more summative testing, and so right now we are pulling in more questions and we are building summative exams specifically for the milestones. And when I say summative assessments, what we're gonna be able to do is generate a 30 item quiz. There's gonna be a lockout so that they can only do it once they start it, they have two hours to complete it, and then the quiz locks them out. So they, they have to get it done. Um, it's gonna do a random question selection, again, from a much larger question bank of about 150 questions. So they literally would have to take this quiz about four or five times before they would really start seeing a large volume of repeated questions. We're gonna allow them to do multiple attempts, and they're gonna have to get a 90% to pass. And we've used this before, this paradigm before, when we piloted this system about a year ago. And what you see there is one of the courses that we piloted at four institutions. This was presented at the STS. It should be published in the annals, hopefully soon. And what you can see is that on every repetitive attempt, the trainees got better and better and better, and there was clear evidence of learning. And it took, on average, about two and a half to 2.6 attempts for a trainee to clear a 90% pass rate. And so with five elements of the, you know, with enough questions in the bank, they should easily be able to take this quiz multiple times and get up to a 90%. And if they don't get the 90%, they go back to the content and they learn some more. And these are going to be a sort of global milestone assessments to allow our trainees to get a little bit of evidence midway through their training at any point that they want on where they're at in their training. Well, there's something else Moodle does, and, and this is of interest to anybody who understands uh, question writing. Moodle provides psychometric data on the items, every item that's in, loaded into Moodle. And what is psychometric data? Psychometric data is all the statistics that surround a multiple choice question. Right here, I've given you two examples. The question on the left was an easy question. You can see that the facility index, which is the percentage of time that people get the question right, was nearly 90%. And when you look, only one person choose an alternate answer. When you look on the bottom here, uh, 80, about 90% of them got the correct answer, but one person who used this question was uh, pulled off by a plausible distractor right there, and he picked the other one. On the other hand, the question on the right is a much more difficult question. When you can see that, they went all over the place. The other thing that we're building in is reporting. 
And then the final thing, something that's going to come probably in, in the long future, but something that's available in K-12 right now, is the idea that the computer itself will do the proctoring. In this system, there are systems already available. It's called intelligent or adaptive learning systems. And in this system, what happens is the student takes the quiz, the computer assesses where their flaws are, and it makes recommendations of readings, pulling stuff out of the content directly to the student so that they know what they need to read next. So I think I'll just leave you with two phrases, and that is that 100 years of educational consistency is probably not a good thing. If any of us in the room said that we're still treating lung cancer the same way for the last 100 years, we'd be yelled out of this room. And then the other thing I'll just tell you, and a third or fourth book to read is Adapt. Change is going to require trial and error. We're going to do some things that work. We're going to do some things that don't work. But I think we'll just keep pushing away at it, and we'll get it right. So thanks.